know it's been a while. Um, I was inspired to write a very long note to you today. I've been writing it, actually, I got a cramp in my wrist. I started writing it when I got home from the grocery store at about four o'clock, and now it's almost eight. I haven't done a damn thing but sit at my table and write to you on um, post-it notes. Actually, my hands are all covered with ink. Anyway, I was just going to write a list, but then it turned into this insane monologue, and I thought it might be kind of fun to actually read you my monologue about my day. So, um, this is a, a um, let's see. I'll start, I'm just going to start with, with how, it, how my monologue starts. My monologue is starting right now. I'm halfway through a rainy Monday, more than half. I know what I need to do. I hope you'll forgive me for it. This post is nothing more than a confession of what I'm not so sure because of my lack of clarity. I've decided to make a list of what I actually did today and tell you in detail how I wanted, or maybe that's too harsh, how I, how I wasted um, or squandered my precious time. Don't worry, I'm not that mean. I'll insert various excuses, explanations, whatever. Call it what you will. I will commence with a painting for you. A portrait of my very own paralysis. Okay, to start. I woke this morning to a dream. I'm not one to bore people with dreams, but since this one struck me as a poignant one, I'll say, I was sitting in a softly lit room with my favorite British conservative philosopher, Roger Scruton. He was sitting rather dolefully, his knees close together and hands placed on their tops as if holding himself together on the end of a long sofa. I would say couch, but I know all classy people say sofa, and so I won't say couch. But if you want to know the truth, when I was a girl, I recall my mother calling it a Davenport, or Davino. I just checked this out, and uh, particularly per Wikipedia, this was common in the 60s in my neck of the woods. So Davino, if you want to if you want to say Davino, go ahead and do that and be very retro. Anyway, sitting on the other side of the Davenport from Roger Scruton sat Shirley MacLaine, and she was having, behaving just how you would expect, petulant, wholly implacable. She was looking straight ahead. I don't know what it was I was doing there in the room, but that doesn't matter. I felt horrid for Roger being tasked with the wrath of Shirley MacLaine. This sounds improbable, but the one time I was ever on a movie set as an extra because I was friends with the producer's wife and she took pity on me and wanted me to experience being in a movie. Actually, I was this woman's employee in another capacity and I think she had a mind to fire me because of my latent and barely obscured attitude of discontentment. <laughs> Rather than doing that, because she was a very nice lady, or, or thought herself to be very nice, she took me under her wing, and I sort of knew I was in deep shit when she started taking me to, like, movies, like, interview with a vampire, and then she gave me and my husband, a uh, new husband at the time, the remainder of uh, her family's Christmas prime rib roast before she and her family set off to continue their holiday in a 500-year-old cottage in the English Cotswolds that they, they owned. Anyway, my husband and I really enjoyed the meat. <laughs> anyway, because this woman's husband also made B-movies in Hollywood, I got to witness the singular artist, uh, artistic rage of Shirley MacLaine firsthand. Um, I remember Liza Minnelli was also on the set. She was in the movie, and she was trying to make a comeback. She had been lost from something, you know, I don't know, drugs or something. She wasn't right. She was on the set. And when Shirley MacLaine uh, couldn't be distra distracted from the gross incompetence that she witnessed in all the technicians uh, around us, um, Liza kept saying, Shirley, Shirley, like she was trying to comfort her or calm her. Um, it was really funny. 
Anyway, so Shirley MacLaine is in my dream this morning with Roger Scruton, both sitting on the Davenport. Anyway, but back to the situation. Uh, I, I recall back on the movie set with Liza Minnelli, um, I actually exchange, exchanged a brief word with her, and she asked me who the woman in the frame on the wall of the cafe where we sat, it was a set of a cafe, she was like, who is that woman in that frame? And I, I was surprised because the woman was Billie Holiday, and it surprised me that Liza Minnelli didn't know who Billie Holiday was. Anyway, I know that Shirley MacLaine uh, isn't really acting in a lot of her films now. She's um, she just has a, a surly side, surly Shirley. Um, anyway, but, but at least that's how she was that day. And she acted just like she she does in so many of her films, kind of, um, like I said, implacable. But anyway, here's the kicker. In my dream, this is the best part, and this is why I'm boring you with a dream. In my dream, Roger Scruton does what no man seems to have done before. Rather than shrink more deeply into the Davenport, he turns and approaches the stone-faced woman, Shirley MacLaine. I think he even bent down and placed his knees on the ground before her. He put his hand on her lap, and then he reached up to her shoulders, like he was steadying her in her anger. And he proceeded to sing to her. And his voice was soft and pure and strong, I can't recall what he was singing. I wish I could, but I knew he was not so much seducing her as singing a sort of pioneering melody. And he, he just persisted and he wasn't, he was, he was unflappable and it was beautiful. Um, he, it was a pioneering melody in that he was, he seemed to be fully intent on settling and establishing himself inside Shirley's chaotic and disordered soul. And what struck me most about the moment was my utter amazement that he was not afraid of her anger. So that's all of the dream I really recall. But I was struck by Roger Scruton's courageousness and also his kindness. He was more kind than I even imagined him to be in real life. I was struck by his lack of resentment. He had it in him to soothe the savage beast. <laughs> Sorry if Shirley MacLaine ever hears this, she's going to be pissed. But I guess she represented to me, as I'm interpreting this dream, there was a savage quality to her. Kind of like a aged social justice warrior or something. Anyway, in my dream, he chose to, to just go at her and he didn't have to comfort her. He didn't have to comfort Shirley MacLaine. Um, I wasn't gun putting a gun to his head or anything. But he did. That's what he chose to do. So that was a really cool dream. And I don't have very many dreams that I'm proud of, sort of like I want to hold on to because they're so, they're so gorgeous. And I've, I love Roger Scruton so much. Shirley MacLaine, not so much. I did like her in the apartment with Jack Lemmon. She was, she was cute then. Um, but cute in kind of like her personality was um piquant and and, and and it worked then but um anyway she's gotten she she just got a little bit um she got bitter you know anyway but she played that in the roles and, and that worked when she was like you know up against like i don't know sally field in magnolia or something or steel magnolias that's what it was anyway so i woke up from the dream it was about 6 30 because i'm talking about my day when i did that's the theme here. So when I came out of the dream, my husband had gotten up and he was putting on water for the coffee. He makes me coffee every morning and he was putting bacon in the oven and he was reminding me to listen for the timer when it went off for the bacon because we eat bacon every morning now too. So uh, there's, that's, there's a story behind that. I think I'll get to that. Anyway, it's all about fat. We need fat. Um, so... Then he went downstairs to work on a song in his office. He likes to do that before he goes to work in the morning. He's a very productive person, and, and I'm really proud of him for, for that. Anyway, so as soon as he gave me my coffee and um, went downstairs, I grabbed my phone. Actually, I, I grabbed my phone before he even gave me my coffee because I was awake. And I, I just automatically reach for my phone because it's always either under my pillow or it slips off 
um, the side of the bed onto the floor. And usually there's like earbuds attached to it. So I can usually grab the little um, earbud, um, you know, the, the little cord. Anyway, and I grab my phone and um, let's see. And I was just thinking about how incredible it had been to have the Roger Scruton dream. And I'd never had a dream with him in it before. So it was just sticking with me. Um, and it was interesting because he wasn't talking about philosophy, you know, because that's what I love him for so much. He's so, I used to listen to him all the time. About three years ago, I started listening to him and I loved his voice and I would listen to him fall asleep listening to him talk. That was before, um, you know, I kind of, I don't know, that was, he was sort of my introduction to, con to, to conservatism in a way that I could tolerate because he's a, he's England's foremost conservative intellectual. He's been, you know, kind of speaking out against um, the left, as they would say, um, for quite some time. And he was like kicked out of the academia, uh, the academia uh, back when he came out with a book, um, like I think in the 80s. But it was good for him because he didn't need to be there anyway. And he went on and he's had a great life and continues to have a great life. Anyway, he's got a comeback. I think he has a university now or he's part of a university program. So it's, it's very cool. Anyway, so the cool thing was that he wasn't even talking about philosophy in the dream, though. He was instead, he was actually behaving like a person. He was consoling someone most would believe unworthy of consolation, Shirley MacLaine. Um, and I just thought it was an incredible lesson for me for a Monday. So I, I was thinking, I was wondering if I should write to Roger and, and like let him know. I mean, like, you know, when you're half asleep, you think like, things like that. But I actually had written him, uh, like I, about a maybe, I don't know, like a half a year ago, I wrote him, um, just to thank him for <laughs> like all he's done for the world. And, um, you know, said a couple things about myself and he actually wrote me back. It was really sweet. And I could find that letter he wrote, but I'm not going to do it right now. Anyway, he wrote me back and he wrote, I think like we went back and forth maybe two times. It was brief, but the first time it just went to his assistant. And the next time when he wrote back, it was with his own email. So I know I still, I have his, it, what appeared to be his private email. So I thought, well, I could send him the dream, but before I could really think about that for too long, um, I, I got distracted by something else. Oh, that was probably about when the coffee came in and I, and I, um, yeah, so that was probably good because sometimes you just need to be distracted from ideas like that. But I still think it's wonderful and I'm glad that I could end up sharing it with you guys. Um, so then I looked down and I saw that I had gotten a text from my older sister. She's like 14 years older than me. She basically was like my mother growing up um, because my mom was not quite right. So my older sister is a really wonderful person. She's pretty crazy. She voted for Trump. She's been conservative for a long time, but so she's really, she's hilarious. Anyway, um, uh, the night before I'd shared this incredible feast with her at a restaurant in, in the town where we grew up. And, um, I told her that I want to like buy her lunch. In this case, it was actually like a late lunch dinner for the rest of our lives because she's always done so much for me. And last year we were out and I just was having such a nice time because we, all through our lives, I've been so busy working. She's been so busy working. We've never just taken time to like meet for lunch or go shopping. We've always been very into taking care of our families and just busy with our, our businesses or whatever, uh, me with school and working different jobs. And so I was so happy to actually be spending kind of leisure time with her that I, I I told her that I would buy her lunch for the rest of our lives. And um, anyway, so I was taking her out for, for lunch yesterday. Um, anyway, so I got this text from her this morning, and she said she hadn't been able to sleep um, the night before. And she sent me a couple links to um, some conspiracy theories surrounding um, JFK Jr.'s death in 1999. Um so if people send me information that's interfering with their sleep hygiene, I tend to look at it. Um, not that I necessarily always agree, but I'm just curious to see what people read and what keeps them up at night. Um, 
anyway, so I, I spent some time, you know, drinking my coffee. And instead of looking at Twitter, you know, it was kind of a long article about JFK and Junior. And so I read all about his tragic death and how some people think that he was murdered and whatnot. Honestly, I've always sort of stayed away from conspiracy theories. But um, anymore, all that we're learning about the CIA and spying and such, I I find myself feeling, I guess, less surprised. Um, and I don't know if that's a good thing. Anyway, so in keeping with this, this is a list of my day. So I'm just going to try and move through. So after that, reading about all that, I checked Twitter um, and I found recently people are saying kind of the same thing. No offense to anybody who's on Twitter. You know, I'm on there, but I, you know, after a while you start to feel like there's sort of a bit of repetition going on, which is fine because a lot of new people coming on and that information is important. But what I tend to do is I focus on a couple different people's Twitters to, they're the ones that I really want to like see what they're saying every day. So I went to Jordan Peterson's Twitter feed, um, just to see what he was tweeting about. And after a while, um, you know, I, some of the stuff that he was saying is, is a little bit repetitive too, because I followed him for a while. Um, but I, uh, looked at that and then, um, I mean, I can't even tell you the details about that now. Cause you know, it's, that's the sad part is that, you know, it's at this, it's been how many hours since I looked at her, it's been a little over 12 hours and I couldn't even really tell you that much right now that I learned about from all that, but except for, you know, a lot of social justice warrior stuff and, um, a lot of, a lot of political correctness and just, um, that kind of thing. That's what I'm basically worried about at this point is just the breakdown of free speech. And I think if we can't have that, then we're going to be in trouble. Um, anyway, so after I did that, my husband came into the room and he was getting ready for work and, he told me that our room smelled like the dog and he asked me to get the dog out from underneath the covers and he the dog had snuck under the blankets while I was learning about the specific surrounding um, JFK Jr's untimely death he, he likes to sneak under there after my husband leaves the room um, and honestly I've you know if the sheets need to be washed I'll you know let him sneak under sometimes anyway I made a note to wash all the bedding after my husband left and give the dog a bath after, but of course I needed to finish all my important research because for some reason I feel like I'm doing research and I don't even know if I am doing research I'm just sort of being pulled into this whirlpool of just constant I don't know constant what so my husband left for the bus and my daughter left uh, for her art school she lives at home because her art school's in town and it's really expensive and to live in town and and also the art school is expensive so she has to suffer with living here but I try and stay out of her hair as much as possible anyway so as soon as they left that was my cue to get out of bed so this is one thing I've realized lately I don't really like being around people who are getting ready to make their way into the world for the last couple decades I was always the first one out of bed um, like by hours, I would always be available to make breakfast or compose the lunches or to bounce things off of like, I need this or have you seen that? But about three months ago, I realized if I could handle the stress of not being in control of other people's preparations, I could stay in bed and um, read Twitter. <laughs> Honestly, Twitter is helping me to be less of a control freak in my own family, but it's making me feel completely out of control with the world. Anyway, it's kind of bizarre. So if everybody's out in the kitchen doing their thing, getting out of the house, I can be on Twitter. And um, so it, in the beginning, when I would hear people out in the kitchen getting ready and doing all sorts of things, it was hard. I wanted to start the day knowing what my daughter and my husband were doing. and But now I realize I'm just in the way. And, and they need to get out of the house without my assistance. I think it will help them grow as people. And I, I mean, it's a hard thing to admit, but I like, I liked helping. Um, but now I'm kind of getting used to being a complete lazy, good for nothing. And I think it's a, an important phase for me to pass through. Anyway, um, so they left and I got up and I was texting at the kitchen table with my sister at this point about not really knowing how to proceed 
in light of all these conspiracy theories. She's kind of gotten really into conspiracy theories this past week. She called me, um, well, she's always been kind of conspiratorial in the sense that she likes alternative perspectives on things. But this last week, she kind of started diving into some classic conspiracy theories. Like, for instance, she started reading all about um, JFK Jr., not Jr., JFK's death. And she's never really gotten into, like, historical conspiracies so much. So I was kind of proud of her for kind of digging around, thinking about history. But she was around and remembered, you know, um, his assassination, whereas I hadn't even been born yet. Anyway, so she just was so excited about, you know, learning about this stuff, which, which was interesting, was that she contacted me because her husband got really upset with her. And his face turned red when she was talking about, like, how she thought the CIA maybe, you know, killed um, JFK. And... You know, her husband is an incredible man. I actually have come to really love him so deeply. And I'm going to be so sad, so sad when he's no longer on this earthly plane. I have to take a sip. I haven't always felt that deeply attached to him, but I think he's a very, very important person. Anyway, when she told me that her digging around on this really kind of a basic, like, mainstream conspiracy theory that's been around forever really upset him... I don't know it. That kind of rocked my world. I'm like, why is he so upset about that? He should have known about that and should have been able to converse in it because he reads everything. And he, he's the one who like got me into like all sorts of conservative thought. And he's, he's just a chronic constant reader thinker type person. Anyway, so she had to, you know, she had to come to me because her husband was failing her and he was, he, he had to go to bed when she, she had to make him like carbonara and put him to bed and take a nap after she mentioned the conspiracy theories about the CIA and JFK. Anyway, so it was really weird, but you know, that happens. Sometimes people just get to the point in their life where they're just tired of learning more, um, about more corruption. I don't know what it was. Anyway, <sighs> So we were talking about that and kind of, I, I've been thinking, well, okay, so say all these conspiracy theories or even a fraction of what you learn is true. Say that's the case. So what do you do then? I mean, there's really nothing we can do. Does it really change what I need to do in my day to day? Does it change how I love people? Does it change, you know, the only reason why I got involved in, in like doing any research and digging around was because I felt like things were directly starting to change and impact my world. So I don't really... But maybe the CIA thing with JFK does impact my world. Maybe my sister needed to find some, I don't know. I don't know. I'm getting off my, my script. But anyway, so I told my sister, we just need to, you know, stay grounded in our lives. And, you know, it's fine and dandy to kind of, you know, do your research and find out things. But ultimately, we still need to get up and um, take care of business. So she was like, what are you going to do today? And since Monday's kind of my day to like take care of things around my house, I don't see clients on Mondays. I love Mondays and I pretty much am a free agent, but I like to be productive. But the problem is, is that like I'm saying to you today, I don't feel like I've been able to be as productive as I'd like since I got kind of derailed by the Trump thing and all of that. I feel like I'm kind of hypervigilant and I feel like I'm spinning my wheels and I feel like I'm in paralysis. So that's why I decided to write all this down and hopefully I can move out of that. Anyway, so I told her I needed to go into my backyard and work on cleaning up the garden so that when the tulips and the other plants start to come up, um, they'll, you know, be able to come up and bloom in a nice orderly environment. But, um, you know, she said she was just going to splash some holy water on anyway. Anyway, but then it started pouring down rain, like buckets, and I don't mind working in the light rain, but not when it's when I'm going to be soaked, you know, in a matter of minutes. So, anyway, just so you know, my sister's not pious or anything. She's Catholic. She's got a dark side. It's fully intact, I think. I'm, I'm pretty certain it is. Um, but she, she likes all the rituals. You know, we were raised Catholic, but now she is kind of, I don't know, she likes the rituals. So, um, she sprinkled herself with some holy water, you know, after, you know, learning about her conspiracies. And sometimes I don't even know if she's joking when she steps up like that. Cause you know, we play, we play each other for jokes, honestly. Anyway, so I'm proud of her for digging around in her free time and trying to better herself through, uh, I guess you could say a brand of education. Um, you know, she's quite the internet sleuth. So after texting with my sister about, 
life after getting involved with unofficial knowledge that makes you distrust everybody in the government. Um, my daughter called me, and I was still in my bathrobe at the kitchen table, and she had discovered a problem with some airline flights that she had asked me to book for her the night before. My anxiety, of course, went up because I hate being confronted by her, I guess, her inattention to detail. Um, it makes me wonder, honestly, how she's going to survive in this uh, world, kind of the dog-eat-dog -dog world. But, I mean, honestly, I think if anybody had been paying attention to me when I was her age, they would have thought I was a complete loon, and then I would have, like, had that mirrored back to me. So then I feel really guilty because I'm like, well, I don't want to mirror to her that I see that she's kind of, like, out there. So anyway, but I felt bad. Um, so I got on my laptop. I don't usually get my laptop out. I usually just use my phone. And I started looking up some other flights with her, and we discovered that the price from the tickets that I had purchased the night before and that she had had to cancel, thankfully she could do that, um, had nearly doubled this morning. So that's how it goes with these airline flights these days. Anyway, I found myself lecturing her a little bit, even in a restrained way. Um, and after we hung up, I then felt sad and worried and um you know, I just get to worrying that I um, am helping her too much um, do stuff that I feel like she should be able to do herself. And then I wonder all sorts of things, like, can't she do it? And then I just um, get really upset. Uh, part It just sort of collapse, and, and, like, my imagination collapses, and it gets harder to get out of my bathroom, um, and it makes me feel useless. So at that point... I picked up my phone and I started looking at Twitter. So there was really nothing there. Um, and I almost retweeted, this is weird, an insurance ad. It was a, pro you know how they have those promoted ads on Twitter? I, I almost t retweeted a promoted ad, um, which I thought was so strange. Anyway, the reason why is because it featured these mean, angry woman dancers. They were like, they were sort of like cheerleader type looking. They had those cheerleader skirts on. They're all in black and white. Anyway, I replayed their dance number, which was like in a little, a little video in the ad. I replayed it over a number of times and analyzed um, their angry temperaments and how that manifested in the stereotypic movements in their bodies. And, you know, I just, you know, the, the little cocking of the head and the snapping of the ha the the fingers and the pointing of the, you know, the fingers and, and the angry glares anyway. And it just made me so sad. And I wanted to say something in a retweet about how I'm sad that women aren't permitted to develop or cultivate grace and elegance anymore. But then I, I decided not to retweet that. And anyway, I'm finding I'm tweeting less and less. And somehow I, I think I have this fantasy that I'm hoping that this will increase the value of my tweets. So what happened after that? I decided I was hungry. So I dished up a bowl of quinoa salad, but I didn't really have the will to eat it. So I'd had some bacon earlier, so I'm not virtuous or anything like that. <laughs> not in a dietary sense. Um, I decided to strip my bed and start the laundry since my husband said it smelled like a dog. Um, so I put the clothes that were in the wash, uh, or put I folded some clothes that were left in the dryer, and I put the, the bedding into um, the laundry. And then I remembered, because I was right down there in the laundry room, that the iron, which was still sitting on the dryer, had this mysterious sticky substance on it. I was reminded, because I saw the iron there. And uh, the last time I had was rushing for work, I tried to use the iron, and I saw that it was unfit to be placed upon my clothing. Um, so I um, took it up to the bathroom, and I scraped the goop, uh, whatever this goop was that was on it. It looked like it was like beeswax or something, like kind of orangey beeswax, like a beeswax candle. I don't know what it was. Um, and I had to use a couple additional products to remove the additional residue. Um, from the metal surface, and that took some time. Um, and while I was doing that, I'm thinking, well, who left all this gunk all over the iron? And I thought to text my daughter, but um, I did refrain. So, yay. Yay me. Um, 
so next time, uh, next after the iron was completed and I washed my hands up and, oh, actually, because I was worried that the residue from the products had gotten in the little holes on the iron and it would get on my clothes next time I was rushing to work and I was like an iron a shirt and it'd get the cleaning products on my shirt. I, I had to like put a bunch of water in the iron and then I ironed a dish towel on my kitchen counter um, to get all the steam coming through the little holes to clear the little holes. I mean, it took a long time to clean that freaking iron. Anyway, so after I put the iron away, I decided uh, to sweep the upstairs of the house. Um, my little dog, he's a small black dog, he sheds a lot. Um, he has a mild skin condition and we've given him like a dozen medications uh, for it, like little steroids and you're not supposed to do that. And I don't know what it's going to do to him, but it's like, anyway, he's not using as much of the, those, those medications now, but we've tried modifying, modifying his diet. Um, anyway, he sheds a lot. Um, one time I went to the vet and she was a very talkative vet and, uh, she said, you know, let's try, uh, taking him off of all these different meats because, you know, some dogs who have these skin allergies, you know, they can't have, you know, basically she listed off every meat that's in all of the, you know, traditional dog foods. And in the end, the only meat that I was allowed to give him was like kangaroo, you know, it was crazy. Uh, I think pork in addition to kangaroo, but I don't think there are a lot of dog foods with pork in them anyway. So we've tried a lot to help my little guy who I, I love. So the moral of that story is don't take advice from a vet after they've just returned from a conference. They tend to be a little, a little excited and they just want you to try things. Anyway, so I was going to sweep the floors um, to get up all of his dog hair. So I did that and after I swept, I decided I would give the dog a bath. So I went to start the water in the tub, which is in the basement. And my husband actually has his own bathroom in the basement, which is kind of great because uh, it's just nice. He has his own bathroom. We don't have a very big house, but so he has his own bathroom. Um, anyway, I always give the dog a bath in his bathroom because the floor is all tile and it's nice and it just seems like a better place. Anyway. So, um, so I went and start the water. I like it to be nice and warm. Um, but my dog, he's kind of weird. He doesn't seem to mind a bath once he's submerged, but getting him down to the bath can be kind of a challenge. So I go up to get him and I take off his little collar so that doesn't get wet. And I say, we're going to give you a bath. And I lean down to scoop him up and he starts, you know, chomping at my hands and he, He's not really nipping and he's not full on biting, but he's snapping at my, at my hand, like a little viper. Like, I mean, it's amazing how fast he moves his head, you know, and I'm thinking, you know, I need to go turn the water off in the bath because I keep trying and he's biting my hand. He does it like five times and he's not breaking the skin, but it's really, you know, he's coming down pretty hard. Um, but I thought, well, maybe the rushing water sound is upsetting him. So I say, wait here, and I go down and I turn the water off. Also, I was wearing this, my big bulky terry cloth bath, bathrobe, and so I thought maybe that was kind of making it so I felt sort of unwieldy in the bathrobe, you know, bending down and this little dog's biting me. So I go and I shut the water off and I come back, or I put a little cold in to adjust it so the water's just perfect for him. And I, I disrobe and I just have my shorts on and my pajama top, and I, you know, I roll up my sleeves and I go back and I approach the dog but he's not having any of it. So he he's burrowing into his little dog bed. He knows what's coming. I mean, he's had quite a few baths in his life. I'm, you know, but he just for some reason he always does this. So he's striking at me more forcefully. And with <laughs> and his teeth this time he's he bears his teeth so high that I can see like the pink gum line, you know, all of his pink gum. So he's just showing me every tooth he has. He's like, "I'm serious." bitch get away from me I don't want a fucking bath um so sorry I don't or uh, I think I'm I just swore I better have a glass of wine or a sip of wine anyway so he's showing me his gums and it looks pretty scary um but I know that um he's not gonna break my skin I think he's just trying to scare me so 
um, he's only broken my skin once. And, and that was, um, one time when he bit my nose, um, because, and that was my fault. I was literally, I was teasing him and I was putting my face in his face. It was during like a boring part of the Oscars a few years ago. And anyway, he was giving me the teeth and it cracked me up. And I think I was like tempting him or testing him to see like, I don't know, like how much do you love me? And then and his teeth were so funny to me because he's such a loving little creature. So when he bears his teeth, he just seems so funny to me. Anyway, so he did at, at one point at the end of that game, actually, uh, that his little, uh, the bite on my nose terminated the game because I, I looked up and my husband and my daughter were like, oh my God, you're like bleeding. So I had all this blood gushing off my nose. And then I had to go to work the next day and I had band-aids all over my nose. People are like, what happened to you? And I'm like, oh, my dog bit my nose. But it was my fault because I was being a ridiculous, re crazy, I'm not going to say retarded. I was, I was acting like somebody who was not very smart. And, and that's not their fault. I was not developmentally delayed, but momentarily experienced a lack of intelligence that led me to be injured by a creature that was giving me plenty of warnings to back off. And I, I disregarded that. So... Um, anyway, so that was the only other time he'd ever really broken my skin. I think, or maybe he's broken my skin a few other times. Like when I tried to take like a snack food wrapper that he'd found, you know, a potato chip wrapper or something. But that was when he was a puppy and he was just learning. And he really wanted, you know, those snack food wrappers that he found like in the, you know, the car, you know, like you have a little bag of potato chips or sun chips or something. Well, he would love those. So he, a few times he did that, but he hasn't done it in a long time. So I didn't think he was going to really break my skin today but anyway because he was, look, he was looking so funny snarling at me more than ever um this morning I thought he looked so funny I wanted to take a picture of him on my phone so I did that I had to run into the bathroom and get my phone which was charging and I, I took a picture of him and I had to send it to my sister um and then she texts back uh lol so yeah that was really satisfying so I realized that I was going to need to scoop him up. He's only about 20 pounds from his rear area where his muzzle can't reach me very easily, you know. So um, I did that. I got my arms kind of back by the butt and I got him up. And, and as soon as we stood up um, and I have him in my arms, it's like the demon that's in him just sort of leaves and he um, is fine. And he's just like his old, his old self. And I take him down and put him in the tub and it goes up to his, well, his legs are pretty long. I don't know, it was maybe six inches deep. But he's pretty much submerged up to his belly. And um, and he was fine through the whole bathing ritual. Um, and he was, he was like a little saint, actually. Just very submissive and gracious when I put the shampoo on him. The shampoo is like this natural flea and tick deterrent. Because um, I saw that the other... Um, shampoo was so bad you're supposed to wear goggles and gloves and it's like terrible and so I was like oh my god I'm not going to get that I don't want to have to wear goggles and gloves and you know put you know um it's actually like pesticides and stuff so I got this other kind of natural one it probably doesn't work at all and anyway but it smells like cloves and it's sort of like has a natural antiseptic quality and it's supposed to kill the fleas and ticks so now he smells like cloves so during the bath it was a really pretty good time. I'm on my knees and I always tell him what a good boy he is and how he's my best friend in the world, you know, like everybody does with their dog. And um, the whole time I'm telling him that, though, he doesn't take his, his eyes off me. I mean, it really is, you know how people, you know, everybody's like doesn't have kids anymore and they just have dogs. Honestly, it's very powerful to have a dog. I didn't get this dog until my daughter was in seventh grade and I'd had dogs all through growing up. And it was great. It's just, it helped me to let my daughter mature and to become an adult and to let go of her because, you know, she doesn't have any siblings. And so the, the dog became the sibling that I could focus on so that she could, like, get out from, you know, get me out of her hair. So she's really grateful that I have a dog. So, you know, the middle-aged mom dog thing, it's real. It's really real. It Don't get mad at people for having dogs, okay? I know a lot of times people are, like, kind of sticklers about this because people aren't having children and they're just having dogs instead. I completely get that. But just try and be nice. A dog can be a prelude 
to actual children for a lot of people, you know, so it's sometimes people just need to do that. And some people just can't have children because they don't have the setup. But we that's another story. Anyway, so, um, um, so me and this dog, you know, we have this beautiful understanding and I, I love it. So after he's out, I take him up and I dry him off and then we play on my bed, which is all, it just has the mattress pad on it. And he, of course, he wants to pull himself along on the bed on his stomach. He's really weird. He has this sort of commando kind of thing that he does. And I have a video of it. Maybe I could put it up sometime. He pulls himself along like he's, um, like in guerrilla warfare, like on the ground and he's like stealth and he just does this and people think it's so funny. So he likes to pull himself. It looks like he might be rubbing his stomach on the ground. I have a neighbor who, I don't know, I could say some things about her, but I'm not going to, but she thinks he's masturbating on the ground when he does that. But I think, I don't think he is. I think he just enjoys itching his whole belly. He doesn't hardly have much of a little thingy. It's just not, it's like, I don't know. He, He's not a very masculine dog. I mean, he's sort of masculine, but not really, even though he is a boy dog. Anyway, so, but he, it, actually, I take that back. We did call him Humpy the first day we got him. He does, no, he is kind of masculine. If you're, if you're sitting down or if the girls are around, he does want to hump your leg. Yeah, yeah, he is pretty masculine. He's, I forgot about that. Anyway, Humpy. He hasn't done it to me that much lately, but if you're stretching your legs out, he would come over and start humping your leg. You know, like if you're sitting with your legs out, not, well, even if they were crossed. Yeah, he's just, you know, I feel sorry for him, you know, in that way. I mean, he doesn't know. He just doesn't know why he's doing that. Anyway, so we're playing on the bed and I'm um, drying him off with the blanket while we're playing and I kind of wrap him up like he's a, a little sausage. Um, and I say things like, who's the best dog in the world? Who's the best dog in the world? Who's the best dog in the world? I, I say it like a million times. Um, and, oh, yeah, you know what? I think I swept after the bath. Anyway, while I, back to sweeping up all of his dog hair. Um, while I was sweeping, I'm just going to switch from the bath that's over now. That whole thing, my dog, it's over. Anyway, while I was sweeping the upstairs of the house, I listened to a video on YouTube and it was um, featuring Stefan Molyneux and I listen to him sometimes, although sometimes his tone is, it's a bit snarky for my taste. You know, I'm not saying that he doesn't have some interesting, interesting things to say, but he's a little acerbic, acidic, and I, that tone, I don't know, it doesn't sit well with me personally, but I think you know, maybe some people like it. But anyway, despite that, he does have some interesting things to say. But this video, he was talking about, he was advising kids not to go to college. And, um, of course, that got me to thinking about, he said it was a waste of time and it was just in leftist indoctrination unless you were getting a degree for something like in engineering, or I don't even think engineering, a degree like, that you, like to become a lawyer or a doctor or something. So, um that got me to thinking about my own college experience and feeling bad about how what he said about most majors being taken over by you know um political correctness is um it appears to be somewhat true at least from my own experience and also from what i see uh, many examples that just are out on you know paraded out on twitter and everywhere in social media so anyway i swept listen to Stefan Molyneux um, tell people to not be indoctrinated, particularly white men. He, he's really worried about white men um, feeling uh, badly if they go to college because, you know, they're um, the devil. Um, anyway, so after I did that, I ate some quinoa salad, and then I looked at Twitter briefly. See, you see a pattern here? Like I do a little something, then I gotta go look at Twitter. It's like I'm. It's like some people have to go out and smoke. I look at Twitter. This is interesting. So anyway, there was nothing really there. I mean, that's kind of good in a way that I'm getting to the point where it's not pulling me in. I'm. I'm thinking that might be, that might be like a good thing. That I might be getting ready to like wean. You know, kind of like, uh, like when my daughter used to like nurse and she was like like stuck to me like a barnacle and then as time went on she would like 
be at the breast and then she would be looking around and she'd be, you know, looking at this, you know, trees or whatever was around and then she'd suck for a second and she'd look around. You know, that's the time to say, you know what, you don't really want the booby, do you? You know, you're ready to move on. And so I kind of maybe I'm getting to be like a kid who's getting tired of the, the tit the tweet. I don't know. It's, it's possible. I hope so. Anyway, but there wasn't a lot on Twitter, but I did notice that, uh, Paul Joseph Watson was making some snarky comments about, uh, Rotherdam and, uh, Sweden burning down. So that got me thinking about, um, I was back at the kitchen table at this point, um, next to my laptop, which I'd gotten out because my daughter and the airline tickets. And it's kind of like, I don't usually get my laptop out. That's sort of like real business kind of stuff, like when I'm paying bills. And anyway, since I was there with the laptop, I decided that I really needed to be more sure about where all the countries in Europe are in relation to each other. Because I was a pretty bad student in high school and I, you know, world geography and all that. I just, I don't even know if we had a world geography class. I, I do remember memorizing all the countries in Africa and doing very well on that test. But anyway, uh, in general, I just feel like I need to have a better sense of where all the countries in the world are. So I opened up my computer. And um, since I usually use my phone to surf the web, you know, like I said, it's a treat um, when I actually take out the laptop, the big screen. It's pretty cool. Anyway, I don't know about you, but I love maps. So I study Europe for a while. And then I realized Holland is actually a coastal region in the Netherlands. It's not really, they don't really call, there isn't really a Holland. See, that was a problem. I was like, well, where is Holland? Because I was looking at the map forever going, I can't find Holland. And then I like had to read a little bit and it was like, oh, well, Holland is now like the Netherlands, but there was like a Southern coastal region that it was, that was attributed as being Holland, but people still call the Netherlands Holland. Uh, but, and I could have this all wrong because, like I said, I was kind of skimming. Anyway, but that's why I couldn't find Holland written down anywhere on the map. Um, but people still say the whole of the Netherlands is Holland. I mean, honestly, I kind of wish that countries would just stick with their original names. Like, my family, my grandparents, they came here, like, I don't know, like, turn of the century, like, 1900s, sometime around there. And they came over, and they were from Czechoslovakia. I don't know when exactly, but it then became like the Czech Republic and then Slovakia. But before it was that, it was Bohemia and then there was Monrovia. And it's like, you know, it happens like all these countries, they change their borders, they change their names. It's just, it's going on anyway. So it can make it very confusing when you're looking at maps anyway. Um, so I think that my family was from Prague. That's what I like. I, I like pictures of Prague. So I think, well, I guess I'm just going to imagine they were from Prague, but I'm not exactly sure. Anyway, both my grandparents are from that area. So I'm, you know, I've always kind of liked the idea of being like bohemian, but um, I think that's why I'm, I'm the way I am. But I, I'm going to go there someday when I can get a good flight, uh, you know, reduced price. Anyway, so, um, so I'm back at the kitchen table and I'm looking at the map of the world and I then I decided to look up Sweden and Finland and because, you know, Sweden's having all these troubles and it's the rape capital of the world and now it's on fire. And I'm like, I got to look at, you know, where Sweden is in relationship to all these other countries and the migrant crisis. And, you know, maps are good. So then I have to refresh my mem memory about all uh, the countries that are in Britain and how the UK is, is not just England only. And so... You know, I've always been confused about, well, what is Great Britain and what is the UK and what is on all this? So I take time to look at this video that um, it takes about five minutes to explain what is Great Britain and what is the UK. Because I thought, well, with Brexit, I need to really understand which countries are really part of that. So, you know, took a little bit of time to do that. So pretty soon I'm looking at all the map of the world and I think about how geography impacts the cultures. And I'm looking at Syria and Iraq and Iran and Turkey and where there's well, quite, quite a bit of fuss going on today. And I think with their leader, and I think that Gert Wilder, I think that's his name, was involved in something. Um, anyway, he's the one who looks like Leonardo DiCaprio. Um, he's, yeah, anyway. So I feel good having studied the map of the entire world for 10 minutes or more. 
and then I decide I'm a bit peckish. So that means you're feeling just a little bit of like a sharp sense of maybe a little bit of hunger. Anyway, uh, my sister cracked up at me um, when we were eating last night at this buffet um, because after it was this buffet, it was place, this place where it was this, I've never been to any place like it was like as big as like a supermarket and it's in the place where I grew up, the area where I grew up, but now it's not anything at all like how I grew up. It's this huge place. It looks seems like you're at like the airport. It's just people everywhere. It's a sea of people and tables. And then this buffet that has every food, Asian food you can imagine, and desserts. It goes on and on forever, and it's super crowded, like bizarre or something. And um, anyway, so we went to this buffet and. And, and, be, and they take your plate away. As soon as you're done eating a little bit and you put your plate aside, they come take it away. And then you just go back and you fill your plate up with, I don't know, like crab legs or sushi or oysters or a fruit medley or fried prawns or pizza or Mongolian grill. or what, I mean, it's just, it went on and on. It was just, it was crazy. Anyway, so every time we finish having a little bit of food and they take our plate away and I'd have a little bit of tea, I'd say, oh, I think I'm feeling a bit peckish. You know, so my sister would crack up um, whenever I'd say that. Um, you know, it's really cool. It's so fun to be... Well, it's enjoyable, I should say, to be... to make another person laugh so effortlessly, like with such minimal effort. And, um, I guess that's how it is when I'm with my sister. And it makes me think like, she's not really finding any of my jokes cause I'm not really making jokes, um, really funny, but I almost feel like she just finds my existence funny or something or, or like my essence. I don't know. Anyway, but, um, so it's just really nice. She just, she, she's, um, I think that I've been cracking her up actually, um, since I was born and, um, because she was 14 when I was born and we went through a phase there when I was sort of dark and depressed, like, you know, in my early adulthood when I was trying to grow up and I was, you know, really kind of probably suffering from leftist indoctrination and stuff like that. She didn't, you know, she just couldn't be around me, but I, I don't blame her for that. Anyway. Um, she still fed me and things like that, but I don't think she enjoyed me as much. Um, she's more secure in herself now too. Anyway. So anyway, so back to the maps. Um, after the maps in a cursory review of, um, you know, a number of the world maps, I started feeling a bit peckish as I say, um, so you don't really know about my dietary compulsions because I'm really private and, um, but actually I'm on a carb free diet right now. I don't even know if it's a true carb free diet cause I do eat fruit, but I took out grains and other carbs. So like, I don't have like bread or rice or corn or potatoes or anything like that, except like one day a week, you're allowed to cheat. But even by then, you don't really want to cheat. You're sort of broken, and you just have sort of forgotten why you love carbs. Anyway, um, anyway, um, I just decided to do it as an experiment, and I asked my husband if he wanted to do it too because he has these um, kind of uh, conditions that are sort of not a really big deal, but they're kind of chronic conditions, like skin conditions and stuff like that. And um, he's never really been able to fix them, so... Um, as an experiment, I um, thought, why not try this diet? And the reason why is because another person that I love so much, um, Jordan Peterson, I think I've already done my very first video or podcast, or podcast, should I just call this a podcast? It's not really a video. Here was about why I think Jordan is a, as a hero in our modern day. And if you haven't heard that one, you should. It's pretty good. It's my first. And I, I cry in it a couple of times. I used to cry more in my, in my, uh, podcast, but I don't cry as much anymore. Um, I think, I mean, I could cry again, but I, I'm glad I'm not crying right now. Um, I, it was a little raw anyway. So I, I, 
I've liked Jordan for a long time, Dr. Jordan Peterson. Anyway, the reason why I thought about this carp thing is because I'd seen that um, he and his daughter, um, they've both suffered a severe and persistent depression, I mean, disabling for his daughter. Um, it, the, and it was very pervasive, and it was generational as well, like in their family, like a number of people have had this throughout the generations. And I saw them on, it was a YouTube video, but it was from a TV show um, that was broadcast in Canada that was done five years ago and then updated, like last year. Um, and it was about him and his daughter and depression in their family. And and then when it was updated last year, there had been this big change. And it came about because his daughter, who um, nothing was helping with her health problems. She had some other health concerns besides depression. But her depression was so disabling that she couldn't get out of bed. She was missing a lot of school. I mean, she would sleep... Uh, two thirds of the day, um, she was just in a really uh, collapsed place, physically and psychologically. Anyway, so she started doing this sort of um, research about making dietary changes in order to possibly address the the medical, physical complaints that she was having, psychological, and so she chose to do that. And um, and the dietary changes were like to eat. I think she was do, even doing low fat. So she was doing like chicken and, you know, chicken breasts and then greens and things like that. So she was cutting out all the carbs and apparently it made this huge big deal in her, um, she, her depression lifted for the first time ever. And she wasn't doing it to address her depression. Even she was doing it to address her other medical concerns. I'm not exactly sure what those were. Um, but they were addressed, but so was her depression. And so for the first time in her life, she was able to, you know, feel what smiling felt like. And, it, and she said it was very strange. Anyway, so that was, I think, in the early 2016, when um, they had this interview on Canadian television. I think Steve Pakin, I think, was the host of the show. I'm not sure. Anyway, it's on YouTube. Look up Jordan Peterson and his daughter and depression. It's there. Anyway, um, so because his daughter had had this um, lifting of the depression, I mean, imagine how hard that would be. I mean, I get upset when my daughter like bungles some, you know, information that she forgets about a plane flight. And, you know, his daughter is like in bed. She can't get out of bed. She's having a hard time, you know, grappling with. I mean, th she could barely do anything. I think she was just having real troubles even going to school and it's really tough anyway and it went on for her whole adolescence she was a disabled person in that way anyway she makes these changes with her diet and it lifts so of course that impressed um jordan peterson and he decided to try it as well and that he had started it i think sometime before the video in the in the spring of uh i think he'd been doing it for maybe a month or so in, so this would probably be about a year ago. And I think it's sort of fascinating when I think about when he made that change and how profound the change was in his daughter. And also, if you notice, he's lost a ton of weight this last year because a diet will make you lose a lot of weight. Um, but I, it wasn't until he went on that diet that he became this world famous person. And all of the um, his life work, his life passion, his life studies, all of it within a year of his going on that diet and who knows what that diet did for his mentality, his, his something, something in him shifted within a couple, you know, within less than a year's time of going on that regime, he's suddenly got his information out there. He's plugged in and he's able to keep up with the demand for his information. It's, I don't know. I'm not saying that it's the diet, but it is sort of interesting so anyway, so um, my husband also has these uh, things. Like I said, he's got some health conditions. So that's why I thought we would try the diet. But we're not doing it nearly as strictly as they did because, you know, we eat fatty meats because the one that we're doing is more like, um, I'd say more paleo, keto, I don't even know what it's called. It didn't even have a name. But you're supposed to, you know, eat a lot of um, meat 
and an egg in the morning and kind of start with like bacon egg and it sort of takes away your hunger and the idea is that fats actually stay in your body and keep you going longer than that kind of spiky energy of carbohydrates and that it it makes it so that you have less food cravings in general so that's what we decided to do and that's why i eat bacon a lot now um but um let's see i think i, I had a script here but i'm kind of got off um So Jordan Peterson said that um, he thought that the grains, you know, he wasn't sure. He's, he basically admitted on that show um, with, you know, the Canadian show with, um, that he said, you know, we don't know everything. And my daughter, you know, did a lot of research and she tried this thing. So I'm willing to try it. And he had never really gone that route. And he had a, a you know, body of knowledge that he believed in. And really, I'd say he beliefs in medical science as far as like you know th what what um he's he's a kind of a big believer in more i don't know i'd say conventional science in some ways not that what his daughter came up with isn't conventional it's just that it's not been studied to the degree that other methods of treatment have been and so it doesn't have that kind of evidence-based um branding to it anyway so he said you know we don't really know and he had to kind of address that and that's why he decided to try it and he said he thought that there might be some link with grains and inflammation and that in, in even like a mild inflammation in the body and that inflammation could be responsible for a variety of illnesses um, particularly those um, linked to autoimmune illnesses and such so anyway um yeah, so that's why I was eating quinoa salad um, when I was feeling peckish. So I um, killed the quinoa salad that we had in the, in the fridge that I'd made. And quinoa is actually a really nice, uh, it's actually not, um, it's a seed. So it's not really a grain. So you can eat quinoa. That's why quinoa is such a big deal because this whole carb thing, which I don't even like to tell people about this sort of thing. Honestly, like I said, I'm just doing it because it's hard for me to see my husband suffering and not getting any treatment that works. So I just thought, why not try it? And plus, he's been really happy eating bacon and eggs and steaks and then lots of vegetables and stuff. So he seems to be doing better. And plus he's losing his little um, bit of weight that he has around the middle. And he's happy about that. Anyway, um, uh, so I ate my salad. And I, I was thinking I got to um, kind of get on with the day. I was starting to feel worried that I didn't have anything to show for my day. You know, you get to that point where you've sort of been sort of puttering around in your own head and in your own thoughts. And and then there gets to be a certain time of the day where you go, well, it's too late for me to be kind of this chaotic and free form. I need to actually do something and make myself look like somebody who does things. So anyway, um, I decided that I would get dressed. Normally, I get dressed early on in the day. That's that's my normal habit but today I was quite free form and and that was worrisome but I don't know start with conspiracy start with a good dream about Roger Scruton, and go on to conspiracy theories studying you know map of the world and next thing you know giving the dog a bath next thing you know you're in your bathrobe and it's afternoon anyway so I got dressed I'd already brushed and flossed my teeth and I try and do that regularly the flossing is something that people think isn't important but it really is anyway so I did that and I haven't always been good about it but I'm I'm really trying to be better anyway um I needed to kind of fix up my hair comb my hair and I took a shower yesterday late in the day so I thought I can get away without taking a shower since I'm just going to the store and I kind of freshened up my face and while I did that I decided well I can't be alone with just me in the mirror, I better listen to something. So I looked at my Twitter for a second and I saw that Scott Adams, the creator of the cartoon Dilbert, um, he was sharing a little, um, he had a little video, it was very short, and it, it was about um, the meaning of life. 
he said he was going to share the meaning of life in a few short minutes. And I thought, well, that sounds good. I'll um, put some lotion on my face and fix up my, um, you know, my spots and with concealer and, you know, try and make myself look presentable while I learn about what Scott Adams, the creator of Dilbert, thinks is the meaning of life. So long story short, you know what he thinks the meaning of life is? I don't know if you can guess. Well, it's don't be selfish. So that was profound. Um, actually, I always appreciate it when people say things that are obvious. I don't have a problem with that. Um, but it might not be obvious to a lot of people. But um, actually, it probably isn't. So I didn't mean to sound snarky when I said that. I thought, uh-oh, people are going to think I'm snarky, but um, I'm not. I I think that we need to say the obvious, actually, probably more than what's not obvious, because I think that's probably the problem, is that we have forgotten what is obvious, or we're not allowed to even know or state the obvious. So that's why it's so funny to me when people like are becoming famous now for being like these radical people. What they're really doing is stating the obvious. So... Uh, well, there you go. That's what you have to do. State the obvious and you'll be a radical countercultural person these days. Anyway, so don't be selfish. So I think I got that somewhat covered in that I uh, try and look outward and I worry about things all the time. And But I'm still selfish. You always have to work on not being selfish. And that's why I felt bad about like not getting stuff done today. So I felt like that was selfish to just sort of go round and round and to not be productive makes me feel bad. And he says, when you start to feel bad, then you need to look at whether or not you're being selfish or not. And then he has this little graph that shows like you've gotten off the graph. And the truth is, taking more than you give will make you feel bad. And that's why I had to get my ass in gear and do something. So, um, um, so while I was taking the clothes out of the dryer, I was thinking about Scott Adams and thinking about, you know, how he put that little video together. And I thought that was pretty cool. And I was happy that he shared it. He feels like basically, you know, he just has what he's got left is to give to the world and then he's going to die. And so he's happy with that. He's got enough money and he feels good. So I went upstairs with all my warm clothes and I uh, put on these jeans. They were nice and soft. I'm wearing them right now. Anyway, um, you know what's so cool about these jeans? I bought them used 10 years ago so but I haven't worn them the whole 10 years so don't you know I mean honestly I that would be pretty cool if I had but um but I found them in a bag uh of clothes that I was supposedly getting rid of um but I never did I actually have a lot of bags of clothes like that around it's like I don't know why but I'll put like clothes in bags because then I think oh somebody might want to go through these clothes that I don't want because they're still pretty good and they might want them. And so I have a lot of clothes like that and they're just, I don't know. So I had gone through this bag and it turned out my daughter wanted a lot of the stuff that was in the bag and it looked really cute on her, like all these yoga clothes that I used to have when I was like into yoga and now she's into yoga. So that was there, but these jeans were in that bag. Anyway, the cool thing is, is that, um, I love them. And they are back in style now. They are, you know what they are. They, I would say they would fall into the category of mom jeans. Um, so the cool thing is that they're a little bit high-waisted and they still fit. So praise be to Jesus. That's, uh, that's all saying a lot, you know? I mean, I should be grateful that the pants that I bought 10 years ago still fit. And I haven't even tried that hard. I mean... I, I drink, I eat what I want, except for now I can't eat carbs, but you know, for the most part, it hasn't been that hard. And I'm pretty sedentary. I take long walks quite frequently, but other than that, I don't go to the gym. So, you know, I work in my yard a lot. There's a lot of bending and moving and you, know, you can be out there for hours and you're picking up stuff and digging and, you know, it's not like I'm absolutely sedentary but I'm not at the gym on a treadmill or going to like CrossFit or anything like that I just I can't do that I don't know maybe that's just that's just my limit anyway um so the cool thing about these jeans is that 
they were part of who I was before I started working with mentally ill teenagers. So they were the pants that I was wearing when I went to the ocean with my family, when I was celebrating getting my first real therapist job. So, um, I mean, it was a well-paying job at a clinic and it had really good insurance and, and it was, you know, at a hospital. So I remember these pants for that. And, um, I was so happy. Anyway, um, I don't know. I think that I hold a lot of my history in the sartorial realm. So that reminds me. Before I got dressed and I was still looking at Twitter, I read about a young professional woman who decided to start a clothing line for rich executive women who want to look excellent in the boardroom, but they hate to shop. So the first pair of pants the woman released in her line was grabbed up immediately and it oversold by like 37,000 or something. It was ridiculous. Anyway, the clothes, they come to you in a box well, in, a, in the mail, because, of course, the women who don't like to shop, everything's in by mail. But they send them to you in a box. I call it the bento box. And because um, the woman, I think, is, like, Asian or something. And so she is able, allowed to use the bento box as kind of a marketing thing. Anyway, it's supposed to be that the bento box of clothes that are really expensive um, for women who don't like to shop is it contains all that all a woman needs to look super, super good, super smart, like in that, you know, classy sense, uh, in the boardroom all week long. So, uh, so I'd read that. So these are just the random bits of information that just sort of sit in my brain. I mean, how did they, they randomly got in there? Anyway, <sighs> and I'm looking at these people who kind of are thinking about how important clothes are to women, but like the important in a different kind of way, like kind of in a foundational way, not like I need to buy it. These are not trendy clothes, but classic clothes. Now, I have been looking for classic clothes my whole life. I am a believer in classic clothes. Anyway, I always wanted, ever since I was a teenager, I always wanted to own just the right pair of pants. Like I would have daydreams about pants. It's a really weird thing. I met a boy recently. He's not a boy. He's a young man who's actually um, as equally fascinated by pants. It's so weird. He's going to college for industrial design or something or occupational design or something, something like that where you design things. Um, but it's not regular design. I think it's industrial design. Anyway, so that was kind of cool to meet somebody who was really fixated on pants. And matter of fact, he took a pair of pants apart and tried to make another pair of pants from those. And I mean, that has been a fantasy of mine forever. Anyway, so the pants that I used to dream about were usually like wide leg trousers. Like they were sort of high in the waist, but loose and smart, smart, smart. Like, you know, like something Kate Catherine Hepburn would wear. Anyway, those were the pants that I always dreamed about. And I actually had a couple black pairs like that. And, and I had a pair of sailor pants like that that I got at this fancy store called Anthropology, and they were made out of bamboo. The fabric was made with bamboo and it was corduroy. And I, I used to rub my hands kind of obsessively on my thighs over the bamboo, the bam fabric made of bamboo. Nobody would know that it was made of bamboo, but it did say that it was so soft. And people probably thought like I was crazy because I would be kind of being hypnotized by the feel of my, my pants. Anyway, um, so I saw that and I, I don't know, there's something about clothes and caring about clothes, but not caring about clothes. It's sort of an essential thing. Anyway, so I got dressed. Big deal. That's what I did today. Finally got dressed with my old jeans and they were hot out of the dryer. Um, and then I went and I did an inventory in the fridge to see what I needed to buy at the store. Um, and, and then I decided I wasn't going to go to the grocery store. Actually, wait, before I went, before I left the house, I went back into my room and I was putting on my boots and then I saw my dog and he was over on his little bed and, you know, we'd had that kind of 
hard time early in the morning with the bath and him biting me. And so he was looking so sweet. And so I had to go over to him and um, I pet him for a long time. I actually sat on the ground next to his dog bed. Now that is commitment when you actually sit down on the floor instead of just reaching down. And I sat there and I sang him a song. It was a senseless, extemporaneous song about, uh, well, how much I love him. And uh, that was kind of weird because I don't normally break into song when I'm talking to my dog. And I think he thought it was weird too. He's like, normally I just say, Ooh, you're so cute. But I was singing and it was really bad. It was a very bad song. And, and, um, he was, he was good about that. He, he let me, he let me continue and, and complete it. And, uh, and then he went to sleep anyway. So after that, I, uh, finally got out of the house. So the story I went to was called, it's called Fred Meyer, and it has, it's not just like a grocery store, it's got all your household needs, your drugstore needs, and the groceries all mixed together. It's kind of this new concept. Anyway, as soon as I um, left for Fred Meyer, left my house, I locked the front door and I set the alarm. As soon as I got out of the house, I felt like myself, like I was escaping something kind of like uh, something too good to be true. It's kind of weird. Anyway, so I uh, got to the parking garage at the store. I was in the underground parking area. It was kind of crowded. And I finally found a parking spot. People were kind of creeping around. It's very rainy and it's kind of, you know, it's kind of, there was some excitement there. So inside the store, I don't know, the store is really important to me. I don't like the store that much, but it does have a history. So inside, you go in the basement when you park in the underground parking lot. You go into the basement where all the, the home stuff is, like the paint and like the bedding. And the ladies' clothes are down there. And uh, it's just the groceries are upstairs. Anyway, so inside I was reminded as I always am when I visit for Meyer, what life was like before things in the world got so weird. I mean, I, that's something I think about all the time. So that store automatically reminds me of the past. Anyway, I went to the household section and I looked at sheets and, and other reduced bedding, like, like some quilts. And I thought, do we need a quilt? And we kind of need a quilt. And um, but then I decided against it anyway, and I was just letting myself linger there. And I remembered while I was looking at the quilts, what life was like before I ever thought to question the mainstream media or back when I was just not a political person, as I used to say. And I've been going to Fred Meyer for, well, four decades, I think. I mean, starting, I mean, from early age and you know, it's funny, like, when you've been going someplace for so long, you know, what happens is, it's like, there's all this innocence and naivete, you know, your former self, um, coveted, I guess, kind of a lost bliss that you may have had, kind of re retrospectively, you maybe didn't feel like you were having bliss when you were younger, but when you look back, it feels blissful. Anyway, all of that is, like, trapped in, um, these places where you were when you were younger. And um, even though this store, it's um, been remodeled, like completely done over, it's still like, it still holds that past. It's odd. Um, anyway, it's like my old self is still living inside the store. And even though um, the vibe there is really different now, um, it's become, well, our city has become incredibly crowded in the last... 10 to 20 years and so all the stores and all the businesses are very crowded it's very different but anyway even though it's become really crowded and impersonal um there's some spots that still kind of are quiet you know like um the candle aisle in the basement it's almost deserted you know like if you need a quiet spot go to where they like sell candles it's always kind of quiet anyway so i bought two bags of tea lights because they were on sale and 
I thought, well, I'll just get one because there's a lot. But then I thought, well, why do why won't I get two? Because I'm going to buy another one. And these are like, you know, 25% off. Why don't I just do this? So I got two bags. Um, I always have a candle burning um, while I cook um, in the kitchen. Um, or if I'm sitting in the living room, I usually light a candle on the coffee table. Um, I just need to have a flickering flame somewhere around. I don't have one right now in here. Um, but that's because this is business and I'm trying to focus and I wouldn't be looking at the candle anyway. Anyway, after I bought the candles or I, I picked up the candles, I bought some veggies and some hazelnuts and I thought about how most of the food at the grocery store now isn't really on this current diet. <laughs> and, um, but I really didn't care. Um, but it's hard seeing it displayed. It's like you don't care until it's in your face and you're like, oh my God, there's like pasta and cookies and all these things. So it's hard to see that. But um, anyway, that is what it is. I'm grateful to be somebody who is alive, actually. And it doesn't really matter what you eat um, as long as you're okay. Anyway, so one thing I did notice about the store today and I and I tend to notice it a lot because now that it's so crowded and impersonal oftentimes when I go to a store I find that because it's like that I pay more attention to people in the crowded places um, because it's like you can't take it for granted you're sort of like a little bit more on hyper alert you know because you're negotiating and you're going to run into somebody or they're going to run into you it's just there's a lot of people and um, it used to be so much sleepier all the years that I was here, just you could go to these stores and feel like you were in another time zone, you know, or in another place. But it's not like that now. Anyway, I miss that. I miss that kind of lost, sort of eternal feeling. You have to go to church like on a weekday when nobody's there to get that feeling. Anyway, so because of that, when I'm in stores, I notice that I pay a lot of attention to people. Um, it was funny when I was going through the cooking section, like where all the dishes are and like, I don't know, like the little gadgets for like how to make bacon in your microwave and all that kind of stuff. Um, this one woman, she just like barreled through and, um, and she was sort of barreling and I thought, is she going to get out of my way or am I going to get out of her way? And something in me just thought she's not. And I felt like normally, normally I'm the kind of person who I always like notice way ahead of time if somebody's coming and I will get out of the way just so that people don't even know I've gotten out of the way. Anyway, but this woman, she and her daughter, she, her daughter was like nine or something, or maybe younger. Um, they just sort of barreled and, and she didn't even acknowledge me. And, um, she barreled past me and she expected me to move over. And it was funny because, um, like I said, I'm always, watching for other people at the grocery store and I, I always try to avoid collisions without appearing to be avoiding the collisions you know but for some reason with this woman it really sort of irked me how she acted like she just didn't she just seemed so I don't know oblivious anyway after that uh encounter with that woman the rude woman or thoughtless woman I for a moment like I felt kind of abused and I was just like I'm kind of like in this weird mood today and but it was just very minor. But the, this is what happened. It was so cool. Then after that happened, I noticed a string of folks who um, I encountered, like right, bing, bang, boom, right after this woman. They were like as equally or more solicitous uh, than me. You know, like they stopped and they looked and it was very strange. And by solicitous, I mean very conscientious. And and I was like, Wow. You know, I could have stayed in that weird headspace where that woman was just sort of rude and barreling through. And But then I, something in me was still able to see that there were all these people who were really still, most of the people in the store were like, oh, excuse me, or oh, I'm sorry, or, you know, because we were all nearly running into each other because the store was so crowded. And, and I was just, um, I was like, you get a bad apple, but if you let it go, you see that the store is so full of lovely apples, you know? And I was able to somehow let it go really fast or the lovely apples helped me forget the little bad apple. And, you know, when you start to see how lovely all the apples are, you suddenly just love all the apples. And, um, you know, apples equal people, right? 
Um, I don't know if people follow my metaphors sometimes. Anyway, um, so this always happens to me. Whenever I think of how much I love people, you know, that experience suddenly like made me have this surge of love for people. It was funny. And that's why I'm even recording it here because this is, you know, the everyday experience. You're like hold up in your own head, perseverating, can't get out of the house, trying to bathe the dog, can't get your clothes on, sweeping the floor, eating salad, looking at world maps on your computer, obsessing about this, that, and the other thing. Finally, you get out of the house and you go to this space where you're sharing it with other people and you, all these encounters mean something. People, you know, these are physical, these are real interactions. It meant so much to me to be at the store, you know, um, to be around people, not just being in my head or being online. And I felt so good being at the store. So it, it wasn't perfect. Well, but it was, you know, it was just, it was real. And it's, I don't know, it felt, it felt very sacred somehow, even though I was just buying, you know, mangoes and some avocados and some, I don't know what else, coconut milk, hazelnuts, candles. So, um, kombucha. I mean, you can basically tell the kind of person that I am but from my other shop. But normally I eat a lot of bacon, like I said, and we're having steak tonight. So my husband buys the steak. Um, he loves steak. He's so happy to have steak all the time now. I'm really happy for him. He's so happy, you know, finally he just gets to eat as much meat as he wants. And, you know, I maybe that's what he needs. So I'm really happy for that. Anyway, so I was feeling all this love at the store and you know what I think about when I start feeling love at the store? I think about you guys, these people that I don't even know out there in cyberspace, you know, listening, hoping for something to come from me. And I think that's so interesting that I think of you when I feel love for the world. And I think I want to tell these people about this moment where I felt so much love for humanity you know, at the grocery store. Um, I don't, I think that's interesting that my urge is to want to share that like proof or something kind of like, you know, you spotted a unicorn. <laughs> like I felt love for people today. I want to tell somebody, you know, so I, I think that that's my message today is I, I feel like that love sort of melted my heart, you know, Oh my God, now I'm going to start to cry. Let me take a sip of this. So, this confession, I guess it's running over time. Um, I never made dinner. I think my husband made it. He's upstairs making the steak, and I think he's roasting the peppers. Two red ones and a yellow one. It's really easy to do. All you do is you cut the peppers up into, like, quarters, and then you take out the seeds, and then you stick them on a pan, and you just drizzle them with olive oil, and you put a little bit of salt, and pepper on them and put them in the oven maybe at like 400 for like 20 to 25 minutes depending on how caramelized you want them they're delicious and you just have them with like a little bit of meat whatever it's all good so anyway he's doing that and um it's all it's all good um I think I better go make the bed though thank you I do feel much more peaceful now after my confession and admission of my sin my paralysis and my squandering. Hopefully I've redeemed myself and um, I guess that's all. Good night, little apples. Mm -hmm.